I noticed uh, Scott Adams started doing stream live, StreamYard. Yeah. Uh, just started on it last week, I think. All right. Let's see. We'll go three and two and one. All right, guys. Welcome back to another episode of Persuasion by the Pint. I'm Jonathan Taylor, along with Sean McCool. Sean, today we we kind of touched on this last week. We got a really interesting uh, topic. We teased on it, and yeah. what I forgot even how we teased it. But we were so excited. We were going to talk about. I think we mentioned we were going to talk about how games can be related to. Um, I don't well, know, we what some other things we're going to talk here. about. Here, I'm going to. I did some little research, and okay, uh, it was all in the article that we're interviewing the author of. Yes. But still, I got a cool word, right? So we're going to be talking about apophenia. Apophenia, I think, is the way you say it. Yeah, apophenia. apophenia. So everybody, is that so the everybody name? should know exactly what we're talking about now, right? Because I mean, <laughs> apophenia. Yeah. So that's what we're going to be talking about. Stay tuned. That's right. Stay tuned. So before we start that, we've got to uh, we've got to, as always, our customary segment. Yeah, our tasting. So, absolutely. You want to bring up the old sponsor? Yes, indeed. Yo. All right. I feel like we should have some old fashioned like breaking news, you know, sounds there. Oh, or the uh, what's that? Um, Man, what was that show like? Something that used to it would always go whoosh, boom. You know, it was like oh, kind of wow. like the Fox News. You know, they yeah. break or the CNN. They kind of break with the uh, red alert. You know, yeah, just you I, I think they get an alert going like every every five minutes now. Yeah. So. Yep. All right. So I'll let you beat do the spiel, and then I'll talk about the beverage from our sponsor. This week's segment is brought to you by our sponsors over at the Original Craft Beer Club. Outstanding craft beers from the finest independent microbreweries in the U.S. As you know, uh, craft brews have exploded in popularity over the past decade. There are thousands of awesome craft beers being produced by microbreweries all across the country. And one of the best ways to sample these unique beers is by letting our friends over at the Original Craft Beer Club do all the legwork. And uh, Sean's going to be doing some of that legwork because he's got one on today and he's going to be introducing that. By the way, you can learn more by visiting them over at persuasionbythepint.com forward slash craft beer. And uh, you can learn all about their uh, monthly or bi-monthly, however you want to set it up, their membership programs where they bring a variety of beers straight to your door. You don't even have to go out and get them. Yeah, I mean, I haven't left the house in six months, so. <laughs> but the beer keeps coming. That's so. fantastic. Not All right, bad. what do you got? What's what's on tap today? I have got an optimal wit, is what it's called. So <laughs> it is uh, optimal wit, unlike our humor on this show. So <laughs> this is a Belgian style wit beer. Uh, four, it's only four point nine percent ABV, so I have two of them today. Uh -huh. um, but it's a low, like twelve point five IBUs. So, okay. but it says brewed in the traditional Belgian style, the port city optimal wit is crisp and citrusy with layers of flavor that evolve in the glass. Like this is some big stuff, man. Mm. Brewed with 100% Virginian grown wheat and the perfect balance of spices that include Spanish orange peel, not just any orange peel, Spanish <laughs> orange peel, coriander and grains of paradise. This brew leaves a lasting impression. And my friend, this is a double gold medal award winner wow so what we'll year see. um i don't know that's a good question print's too small to read i don't know that it actually doesn't say doesn't matter it, it was like best beer and then it was the best wit beer as well so right how is that how is wit beer spelled is that the, uh w-i-t-b-i-e-r i think okay. yeah that's good all Man, right it's light super light what Wow, twelve IBUs too. I mean, that's uh, yeah. that, that'll be interesting. Yeah, it's gonna be. You know, it shouldn't be like an IPA if it's a Belgian style, so it's not gonna have that cloudy. It's very clear once the fizz goes away. But so anyway, very light drinking beer. So what do you have over there in in the big town of Louisville, Louis? So straight from Bavaria, the Bavarian uh, part of 
uh, what is it, Bavaria, the Bavarian Alps. Somewhere We've in there. got our friends over at uh, Schultz Bra. We've had a Schultz Bra uh, on before, and I cannot remember. I'd have to go back and look. But this one's, I, I haven't had this one. This is a double uh, or a Doppelbach uh, lager. Okay. Lager. But this is an 8.2% wow, lager. That's pretty, it's pretty heavy for a lager. Yes. Lager. Cool. Schultz Bra. Schultz Bra Brewing let's see, Company. Let's see that can again. Oh, yeah, yeah. Let's see. I'm looking at so many different angles here. All right. I know. Wow, that's fancy. You, they've oh. always got that fan, the uh, logo. Coat with of the arms. Shield. Yep, the coat yeah. of arms and everything. So, All right. Pop that sucker open. And then uh, our, I think you said, uh, yeah, we have a, our guest has a drink. So we should probably right. bring them on and then we'll. That's right. So I'll let you announce our guests and bring them on. Don't forget to hit the that button that you're supposed to hit when they come on. Ah, that button. I've got that button ready. All right. Jimmy, is it Shabbat? Shabbat, yeah, you said it right. Shabbat, Shabbat. welcome to the show. We got to give Jimmy some applause. All right. So Jimmy uh, is going to be, we're going to get into your bio here in a second, Jimmy, but you have brought a beverage. Sometimes our guests don't have a beverage. Sometimes they have a, we actually let them on with a water, a bottle of water sometimes, but that's okay. But you've got something really good today. Yeah, you know what? I was. I'm glad my assistant has done an excellent <laughs> job preparing me for this because after seeing your guys' intro, I'm a little bit, you know, uh, happy that I'm uh, prepared here. I'm not as sophisticated as you guys with your with your craft beers here, although I am with a whiskey. I, I, I'm normally a, a, a vodka drinker, pretty simple mm -hmm. vodka on the rocks. But she was like, "It's craft beers or whiskey." So I was like, All right, you know what? Perfect. I was given a gift. Last Christmas for a uh, Japanese whiskey, and it's a uh, Hakushu. Um, oh, cool. you can see that it's a twelve-year single malt. Very and nice. I'll, you know, I'll sip it. You know, every now and then, you know, just neat, and it's uh, it can knock you on your ass. It's a different kind of buzz than than your normal vodka drink. Yeah, uh, for your craft brew. So it's nice and subtle. It's a great buzz, so it'll get me to relax here for our for our nice little podcast. Very nice. Yeah, we. Uh, I've had like I think Suntory is an, is one of the Japanese whiskeys I've had that's really good, super smooth. Like yeah, yeah, you can go through half a bottle and not even realize it. Like it's crazy. Like it's just yeah, you don't. Oh, smooth. you got through a half a bottle without? Yeah, that. I mean, impressive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got introduced to it. I went to a whiskey bar, and I'm not much of a whiskey drinker, but you know, I had a couple of those drinks, and I was like, wow, this is different. And yeah. so uh, I shared that experience, and then I got gifted a bottle. So it's good to have in the office here. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Cool. Very cool. Cheers, guys. All cheers. right, cheers. Now, is that one you've had before, Jimmy? Uh, no, this is this one's a new one to me. I, I think I've had the same one, Sean, you were talking about. Again, I'm not as familiar with whiskeys, um, yeah. but, I mean, I've had this drink before tonight or today. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, it's a good uh, it's a good whiskey. Cool. So uh, I know you don't drink a lot of whiskey and bourbon. We usually give a score of like one to five pints mm. on the show. So of, of your just beverages that you've had, you can either do just whiskeys or just, you know, sure. liquors in general. Like where would you put that on a scale of one to five? Oh, it's up there. Uh, four, four and a half, somewhere around there. Uh, it's cool. got a really nice uh, kind of finish where you can feel it going down and it kind of just heats up your core. Um, so it lasts. I mean, it, I, I, I would probably want to put some ice in it to kind of chill it a little bit and water it down because just neat. It's intense. I, don't know, I, I, <laughs> I love it. I love day. my, I love my neat. I, I do have some whiskey stones to make it a little cooler yeah, if I want. Right, cooler, right. But, yeah. Um, every once in a while I'll do a splash of water. It's supposed to release some stuff, but I can't really tell yeah. the difference. Yeah. Those big ice balls I, I usually would use. That's so that what I use. I like, yeah. I've got the tray that makes the, uh, the really nice round yeah. ice ball. You yeah. just put in the freezer, drop one in. You yeah. have the death star kind the ones that look Absolutely. like the death star. Yeah. I get a little, I kind of chisel out a little piece there to make it look authentic. And, yeah. Yeah. It, it oh. looks good too. It's very impressive looking when you've got that big round ball in there. Yeah. Yeah, but my cool. wife, she laughs at me. She's like, you wuss, you know, cause she drink, she'll drink bourbon. So that's my choice is a uh, bourbon. Okay. And uh, my wife will drink bourbon too, but she, she likes it straight. She likes it neat. Yeah. You believe that? And she pokes fun at me when I put an ice yeah. cube in there. You got a winner there, man. You got a winner there. 
yeah. I, I usually it's either vodka or tequila. I like a nice tequila, and I'll drink that both ways. Uh, usually, I shoot tequila, drink vodka. Right. But uh, it's uh, they're both good. It's a good whiskey that I have here today. Very good. All right. So you gave you gave your rating, Sean. Time to uh, time to rate yours. Yeah, I'm gonna give mine like a. Um, I'm gonna give it like a two seven. I don't love it. I mean, we're dark beer guys, but you know, this is um, this, the second and third sip was better than the first. I think it's airing out. Mm -hmm. It did say it would evolves in the glass, so it 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 seems to actually be doing that. Yeah, that was interesting. Copy evolves in the gra glass. Uh, yeah, so I guess <laughs> as it air outs, it gets you know the, it's better. The flavor is good, but it's it's not at all like an IPA. It's more. It's definitely got more of that citrusy sam adams kind of feel to it that sure. belgian yeah. um it'd be really good in the summer i think um but yeah i mean i'd give it a i'll give it a two two seven two but eight. it was a spanish citrus right didn't you say it was a spanish? spanish orange peel yeah yeah, yeah. yeah so and i have notes for all that so it's not like we're that smart jimmy we're just <laughs> that's the cool thing about the original craft beer club is they like they send you notes with your beer so you that's know right. you know what you're getting so it's kind of kind of cool like that <laughs> So Jonathan, it's great you, for a, you know for a schleps that we we can talk about and we can, it sounds impressive to sounds our audience. Smart. But uh, we even have some trivia that Sean throws out there every now. And then, oh, wow! So. Yeah, that or we bring on guests to make us look smart <laughs> together. That's our other little hack. Nice. So Jonathan, what's what do you rate that yours? Oh man, I'm going to give this one a I'm going to give this one a four three. Wow. It's really good, really wow. good. I, I, it's a lager, so I'm not gonna. I mean, I kind of. I still like. I love lagers, but um, yeah, I feel like it's um, it's it's a little sweet, but I don't think it's too sweet. It's it's a pretty nice balance there. So, cool. eight and a half, uh, two for a lager. So it's uh, wow. pretty good. Yeah, I was gonna say it's pretty stout, but it's not. Mm -hmm. It's a lager. So. Yeah, I mean, look how dark. I mean, that's oh wow, it's pretty dark. It's pretty yeah. dark for a lager. Yeah. Um, so I like it. Four three. We have a uh, Facebook user comment that says, hello. So <laughs> that's it. That's all it says. So, hello. Hello. Hello, Facebook user. So, Jimmy, we got to introduce you. You're the, um, so I want to give you, uh, first of all, where, what part of the country are you from? I'm in Buffalo, New York. Okay. Ooh, awesome. I heard it was, I've got a coworker that's up there. Mm. And he said it was like negative two. He's in upstate New York. I don't know where exactly, but is, yeah, was it cold there today? Chill. I mean, I mean, I've lived here my whole life, so it doesn't really bother me. So when it's negative two or, or twenty, it feels the same. Uh, it's cold. I, I will say that it's the toughest part of the winter. Sure, yeah. um, but it's chilly. Are you a Bills fan? Yes, I am. I mean, I got to be proud of what they did this year, but it, it was disappointing last week. Um, yeah, I mean, but yeah. Cool. I, I was rooting for them um, last Sunday just because, you know, the Chiefs, they went there last year. Yeah, so they, like, they got their title. So, yeah. I mean, we've been there four times, but we still <laughs> don't have a title. It would have been nice. I, I would have been happy actually just going to that. Yeah, sure. And, and yeah. even losing. But, but it would have yeah. been a great matchup versus Brady because <clears throat> he's had our number for 20 years. Oh, so absolutely. It would have been a storyline. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely – like, that's the one of the first, like, you know, dynasties, of course, you had 49ers and stuff. Yeah, right before. You know, and, and I remember growing up, but like, I remember the Bills going with Jim Kelly going back and back. And I was like, man, that's, that's crazy. Oh, man. yeah. But then you had the 49ers <clears throat> and, you know, Cowboys in the early 90s. So, yeah. yeah. I had a friend in high school. He was a huge Buffalo fan. Um, he was from New York and uh, he moved did, down to my. How did a my, high school? Oh, he moved down. I was going to say, how did a high school kid from Georgia <laughs> even know Buffalo existed? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was a he was a guy from New York. He was a transplant here, and uh, man, I just it was during those years, during those uh, ninety, those early ninety years, where it was just a one year after another. Yeah, it was hard. It was a fun ride. I was you know a teenager during those times, so sure. you know, my formative years in sports, and it was just heartbreaking. And then we went into a drought, so yeah, it was nice to come out of that in the past couple of years. Oh, absolutely, yeah, no doubt. Well, we're going to be, uh, do you want to do a bio, Jonathan? Yeah. Or? Yeah. So Jimmy, after mm -hmm. all of that talking, we want to, we want to welcome Jimmy on. He's the CEO and founder of Zizzo. Is that Zizzo Technologies? Yeah. Zizzo Technologies. Yes. Zizzo Technologies, which is a workforce gamification software company. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, while well, gamification, of course, is uh, different than traditional, a traditional gaming company, Zizzo focuses on providing a complete gaming experience instead of just gaming elements applied at work. So this is going to be interesting. And what we're going to be talking about is not only, uh, you know, Jimmy's background, what they do, but we're also going to be discussing a article that I sent you, Jimmy. Uh, it was uh, we recently uh, discussed last week or we kind of touched on last week, but the title of it is a game designer's analysis of QAnon. And one of the interesting takeaways from this article, and that's why we wanted to reach out to you, was that the there's a lot of correlations behind uh, some of the what hooks so many people into uh, things like QAnon or other conspiracies that are elements that are taken directly from gaming. And I found that fascinating. You know, I, I don't know if you had a chance to go through the article in full, but uh, I was just blown away by it. Yeah, it, I mean, it was ominous. I mean, it, it <laughs> thing. I, I mean, I think everybody, even if you're non-political, the past couple of years has been true. Really, you got to be if you're if you're not involved in it somehow. You know, you're you're hearing about it every day. Right. So, um, of course, QAnon is kind of like a, a subcategory of of one side that you know people call the right and conspiracy theorists. Right. And when reading that article, I mean, I didn't. It was eye-opening for me as well. I mean, I, I didn't realize just the in-depth and kind of manipulation of and how it relates to to gaming. Uh, and we'll talk about how gamification has some relationships with it. But yeah, what an interesting read for sure. Yeah, yeah. So the article is called uh, "What Was It?" Game, yeah, game designers and analysis Q and on, which we better not say that too many times. We'll get our YouTube channel <laughs> delisted or something. Um, but I mean, yeah, the talk, the this idea of, of apophenia, which is, um, I think I got the definition here. So, because I know not everybody knows that definition, <laughs> if anybody knows it, <laughs> it's, it's the tendency to perceive a connection or meaningful pattern between unrelated or random things, such as objects or ideas, and you know how much how much of our own story that we want. To, and this is not new with with Q, right? It's, it's been around with, you know, Illuminati, Bilderberg group, Masons, like anybody that's trying to do any tracking of those things, they've, they've kind of come across these quote clues and, and you start bringing your own biases into this. Um, so Jimmy, like, how does that, how does, what part of the gamification process that you guys do? And if you want to kind of explain a little bit about what you do, but then, and we'll kind of talk about, what are we tapping into to persuade people to really just, you know, just fall into this stuff in a big way? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think there's a correlation. I don't know if there's necessary a relationship between the two mm-hmm. and, you know, maybe I'll start with uh, kind of gamification and, and gamification kind of taps into those uh, extrinsic motivational tools that people read like rewards uh, and avatars and recognition um, things that help pe- keep people engaged. One of the things that gamification helps solve, and I'm not sure how familiar you are with the problem of attrition in today's uh, today's world. Uh, specifically, it's not just millennials, it's millennials and Gen Z. Uh, they're very distracted, they're very disengaged at work, and there's that leads to a very high attrition rates, which costs businesses a lot of money. So, um, you know- now, we, Are you talking about from an employment perspective or a customer? Yeah, yeah. No, from an employment perspective. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, as a as an employer, you know, you're looking for ways to create a work environment that's engaging, that's fun and that will keep people working with millennials. It was more about kind of uh, having something that they're a part of bigger than just work. Right. So mm-hmm. you had a lot of these big corporations that were kind of uh, supporting different charities and having purpose, you know, in life and, and, and employees kind of, you know, they like being a part of that. Uh, this younger generation, Gen Z, they've they've been nurtured since birth on technology. And right. if you've ever seen a one year old pick up an iPad and just the amazement of how quickly they just adapt to using that and just scroll through it. Yeah. I mean, that's that generation, that's Gen Z. And, you know, they're they're in our workforce. And by 2015, 
uh, between them and the millennials, they'll represent uh, 75% of the workforce. So wow. it, we feel it's a time to change management styles. You know, we want to revolutionize the workplace management tool. So we're leveraging the things that this generation has been conditioned on, you know, whether it's social media apps, uh, video games, you know, anything that has to do with technology, I think you've got to, you've got to deploy that as a tool and a resource to help keep them engaged at work. So that's, that's how, what we're doing now. What, what uh, Apophenia is, is you know, what it reminded me when I read that, it's almost like, do you remember back in the days that the book where you're like, if you want to decide this, go to this page. If you want to uh, yeah. this, go to that page and, and kind of pick your own storyline. And yep. it was a little bit of that, but more ominous and more with the community, right? And a much larger community. Sure. And I think our, our nation was primed you know, for that level, that type of manipulation, you know, because people were trying to grasp and try to create some sort of unity. And there's a lot of division in our, in our nation, unfortunately, now. So uh, that's why I, I feel that there's a sense of correlation only because we're kind of both leveraging the psychological aspect of technology. And, you know, we're, they're using it, what I think is for a bad purpose and, and, and more malicious reasons. I don't actually know the, their purpose or their reason, but yeah. um, we're trying to use it to help people stay engaged and, and stay employed uh, for their own sake as well as the business's sake. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about the article and we'll, I guess we'll post that in the show notes, Jonathan, uh, yeah. a link to the article. So, uh, really well written. Um, like you said, very eye opening. But one of the first things it starts with is they were testing you know, this idea of one of those like clue rooms where you go yeah. into and they had a design, they kind of knew what they were, and they, you know, they wanted to see how people react. So they, they were watching the people go in and there just happened to be like three random like pieces of a stick on the ground because it was a dirt floor, like a basement type thing. And people immediately assumed that that, that was a clue because it was kind of sort of shaped like an arrow pointed towards like a wall mm -hmm. and like, everybody jumps to the conclusion that 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 well it's here it must be a clue right. yeah you know and, and i i think and then from there it's like everything must be a clue you know mm -hmm. and it's kind of if everything's a clue then nothing's a clue in my <laughs> in my opinion but it's so what is do you have any idea jimmy like what is that part of the brain that's that just that has to make those connections and has to have meaning uh i i mean if you've ever uh played a puzzle, right? And usually puzzles, puzzles have an ending, right? And so, you know, there's a sense of accomplishment that people have when when finishing a puzzle. And, and I think that's part of what they're talking about is one, the, the enjoyment, the journey of solving a puzzle first. And I mean, what they're using, they're, they're, they're playing with a much, much bigger sandbox with limitless right. Uh, possibilities and really no end in sight where puzzles usually have an end. So um, the scary part of what this article kind of talks about is the fact that, you know, we're easily manipulated and we're leveraging things that we're again conditioned to do and what we're really motivated by to use, you know, psychologically to keep us engaged. And, you know, that example that you mentioned with the arrow and they use the, the term, it's like a Scooby-Doo easy kind of yeah flu yeah. and they didn't go for that they went for the less obvious but um seemed more more uh romantic i guess kind of clue because it led to even a bigger clue and right. so it, it's again that that problem solving kind of mentality that we have that we like to be a part of a process that that, that gives us enjoyment and it ends with a reward so how do you how, so i'm curious shifting back to the, to the business world yeah. how do you create these endpoints, right? Because business never ends, right? I mean, you, you're you always kind of there being employed and ideally you'd like to keep that employee as long as possible. Sure. Kind of reminds me, I think uh, Simon Sinek wrote a book this past year, The Infinite Game, yep. where he views business as more of an ongoing thing than like a, you know, an, you know, a game where it's ended, where there's a finite game, it goes back to the quote, you know, finite games and infinite games, mm -hmm. um, that book. But so how do you keep people engaged without like frustrating them? Cause you know, at some point you get frustrated if, if the clues keep being clues and you don't ever get any resolution. Mm -hmm. Like how do you, how do you balance that? 
Well, I mean, gamification is a little bit different than gaming. So when we you talked, Jonathan, earlier about how we bring the gaming experience, not just gaming elements, right? Mm -hmm. Or gamification elements. So gamification elements, some of the gamification elements are things like leaderboards, uh, rewards, badges, uh, some sort of store, Easter eggs. Uh, these are kind of gamification elements that keep users engaged. Um, from a business standpoint, you know, you have to use something that is related to business. So KPIs, which, you know, are key performance indicators are where we start our gamification process. So there are certain behaviors. We basically reverse engineer your, your bottom line, right? Your, your, the most important KPI, which is profit, right? And so we work backwards from there that you need revenues to generate profit and there's expenses. And we focus on the revenues and what behaviors or results lead to the revenue. And <clears throat> in call center, for example, you need to make phone calls and you need to contact a consumer and you need to, you know, be able to close a deal. And, you know, that deal maybe has some elements in it that's broken down even further into other different KPIs. So we uh, identify or help the businesses identify those KPIs that, that drive your business objectives. And then we create challenges for those. So, you know, and we, we create rank levels. So, you know, we understand that, you know, a person just starting is not going to be expected to do the same thing as somebody that's been there for two or three years. And so we set reasonable expectations and on a daily basis. And so just like we, you know, there's variable rewards, there's also should be variable challenges. So every day there's a new challenge is picking different KPIs and different behaviors that you want to push in that direction. And as they're completing these challenges and these goals and these milestones, <clears throat> they're earning rewards. Uh, we've got multiple rewards. So XP being one of the main drivers. And if you're into gaming, you know, XP stands for experience points and that drives your rank level. So as you're getting promoted, your challenges are getting more difficult, but your rewards are getting higher. And so, and then also the recognition is more because you're getting badges that showing that, hey, you're an all-star or you're a superstar or, you know, uh, even greater, which is the legend status. And so that's part of the, uh, the experience that we're trying to create is very similar to the video games that are out there in the marketplace. And, you know, we're borrowing things from Fortnite. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that game, but oh, yeah. <laughs> huge. I have a 14 year old son and I can't tell you how many dollars, real dollars I spent on fake dollars that he used to buy skins and emotes, which are basically dance moves. And we're borrowing from that. We've actually got an avatar system so everybody can create their own personality and their own likeness and their rewards they can use to purchase in our reward store to upgrade that avatar. So, you know, we're really borrowing from that video game uh, mindset you know, because that's what they grew up on. That's what they understand. So let's leverage yeah. to keep them engaged at work. That's fascinating. I mean, you know, I'm Gen X, I guess you, is that about? You yeah, we got the same gray yeah, hair. Yeah, we got the same gray. Yeah. So you got more hair than I do. I got none. So, <laughs> um, but like, you know, I see that in my current life, like I have a Peloton. So the leaderboard on the Peloton, the, you know, they do badges. The badges don't do much for me personally, but the leaderboard <clears> is incredible. <throat> Like the way it works is, is pretty amazing, mm -hmm. you know, cause it has all time riders for any given ride and you can compete with, you know, 20, 30, 50, hundred thousand people around the world by age group, by, you know, male, female, all that kind of stuff. And that's certainly like very effective. Like my goal is always, you know, top five, top 10% on any ride. That's, that's the, the gamification part for me. If I can hit that, I feel like I had a good ride. Um, yeah. Like the badges don't do much, but I, and then I was thinking as you were talking, I was like, man, even Home Depot does this in Lowe's with their aprons and the badges that they give people yeah. to mm -hmm. put on their badges. Swag, yeah. Um, and then like um, GoRuck is another one that has the, the patch system <clears throat> where you can get patches if you do certain events and all those kind of things. So it's not just digital, like this stuff works. Oh, yeah. Know, yeah, brick and mortar. I mean, it's gamification has been around for a long time. I mean, it's nothing new. Competition is 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 part of our human nature. You know, we want to be the best, you know, and and we want that recognition that we're the best. We want other people to tell us we're the best. We don't want to just say we're the best. You know, we right. want proof. And, you know, that's another thing that we provide is that transparency. And like you said, leaderboards is part of that transparency, showing it. 
and it's you know it's empirical data that's that we're using it's very objective you know there's no subjective decisioning here where a manager says you know what i like you and i think you're really doing good so you're the best uh, you know everybody's on the same playing field you know <clears throat> playing the same game with the same point system uh, one of the things that we've learned in our research and we've been able to prove it internally here is that there is competition but this new generation actually prefers to work collaboratively towards a common goal as opposed to competing against one another you know to see who's the best so you right. you know there's a lot of contests that we've we've done in the past uh, where we said, hey, hit this goal and you guys all get to go home early paid. And 95% of the time they would hit that goal. Uh, and we did our further research when we were building out this gamification platform and we found that it, it's not unique to just our environment. Uh, most of this younger generation, uh, even the older generation, our generation, you know, also likes to work as a team and collaborate mm -hmm. on the goals. That makes sense. Um... And I got a lot of, uh, so many different questions. I'll let Jonathan go. It makes me talk. think of the, uh, and I'm trying to, I was trying to think of the, um, the Netflix series that's on right now that we were talking about recently, Sean, uh, the cult and, um, I'm, I can't remember the name of their group, but anyway, it's fascinating because they use game of, you know, gamification. Like was that the vow? Huh? Was it the vow? That series? Yeah. Vow. Yep. Yeah. Hmm. Method. Yeah, it's a fascinating documentary. If you get a chance, Jimmy, it's yeah, they use like colored sashes and yeah, because you, know. I, I mean, you go to different levels and it's like you get to a certain level and you get a different color sash and you get a stripe on that sash. It's like a lot of like uh, martial arts, but they or mil military or military, right? Exactly. So you're you move up the ranks as you show your loyalty and you commit more of your time and more of your energy, which mm -hmm. ends up being you start to find out like people just exhaust themselves at right. the level of commitment that they make, you know, to this cult, <laughs> but I'm, but they get, I mean, once they're so exhausted, they say, you know, how they come about, you know, to, to, I guess, energize them even more to continue on. It's like, Hey, look, look at how far you've come and look at, you know, look at what you've accomplished and you're so valuable to this team. And, and uh, you know they give them incentives to to move forward. Um, so it's 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 amazing. I mean, it's obviously incentives can be used in the right way. Mm -hmm. Obviously, in companies and gamification can you can be used in the right way. But we're also saying it's just like anything in life. Things can be used to manipulate people, and things can be used for good too to incentivize people. So it's just it's a question of who the person is or the organization is behind that. Yeah, it's a it's it's a tough thing to balance uh, <laughs> to, to do it the right way and to make it um, to have longevity, right. For it to be effective yeah. term uh, right. it can get very, very old, very quickly. So, you know, I, this was born because I was in the call center space, you know, for, mm -hmm. for 12 years. And, you know, I developed this over the years in my own environment uh, just for my own purpose. And we it evolved so much that it, we took it to market. Um, but one of the one of the things that we we tried to address is is that, that how games or contests became became old and, and ineffective. One of the things that would happen is you would have these contests, and the same you know three or four people would win all the contests because they were the highest skill, the sure. depth, and everybody else would be demotivated by it. So you would try to change it up and say, you know what, what we're going to do is we're going to give everybody an opportunity for. Every deal you close, you get a raffle ticket. We have a Chinese auction at the end, so everybody has an opportunity to win. You know, the more effective you are, the more opportunities you have. And then you get somebody at the low end of the totem pole wins the big prize, and then everybody else is pissed. So, you know, it's hard to get to make everybody happy. And so what we developed is, you know, you built this budget and you create these micro games with micro rewards yeah. that, you know, that they build up over a period of time, you know alongside of the recognition tools, alongside of the badging systems, alongside of the social engagement, you know, they build their rewards up <clears throat> and then they begin to pick their, um, the reward in the reward store based on their preference. Right. So you're not giving away bills tickets to somebody who just hates football, you know, yeah. winds up selling them for a fraction of the price, devaluing the whole purpose of the, the contest. Right. Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot to, to keeping, 
you know, the, uh, the novelty of gamification alive for a long period of time. So it's, it's one of the things that variation is important. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, a uh, couple things came to mind. First of all, like I would have to say, I would think this makes like quarterly performance reviews or annual reviews so much easier for a manager. 100%. Cause it's yeah, like you've got I'm actual like, data there. Yeah, we used to have a term or a tagline it's called micromanagement without the micromanaging because you just give the tools over to the the agents and you say, here's what we're measuring. Here's where you measure against those measurements and here's where you measure against your peers. And so, you know, there's clear transparency into into an insight into all of your data and your expectations. So when it comes to have that conversation, you know, there's no questions like what I never even knew. Uh, you've known this whole time because you've been looking at it every day and we update you on what you need to do every single day. So, um, yeah, the, the, the reviews are, are very simple. It's basically a sign off because that would, uh, that would be yeah. amazing. Like I, I, yeah. right now I manage a team of about 10 people and that would just be amazing to, because <laughs> yeah. so, so much of the, the reviews, the traditional reviews are subjective. And I mean, you have KPIs, but there's a lot of subjectivity in, in it. Sure. And if your manager's having a bad day and dear on oh, review yeah. day, yeah. I mean, like, you know, you're going to have a bad review. I mean, you just are. Yeah. Human nature. Well, it's, it's funny you said that, you know, I actually, I never trusted my managers to, to do things objectively. And I knew that it, it was based a lot on relationships that they had with each employee. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think that was fair to everybody because, you know, not everybody is extroverted and social and, you know, some of your best people can be introverted and very, you know, non-social and they could be looked at as hey, these aren't friendly people. So I don't want them on my team. Right. Uh, and you get, you lose good people. So, you know, by using at least 80% of the score as data driven, then, you know, of course there's, you know, that other 20%, you know, how are they on the floor? How are they, you know, with relationships with their peers? Uh, those are all very important and you need some sort of subjectiveness to that as well. Yeah. And I, I like the fact that you said they're looking at it every day. Mm -hmm. Like most people don't think about their quarterly review until it's quarterly review time, you know, managers included. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you're looking every day just automatically means it's going to get better. Like oh, you're just, yeah. I mean, that's yeah. just what you measure improves, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. That's cool. So I'm curious, Jimmy, like when you went through this, jumping back to the article a little bit, mm -hmm. I'm curious what stuck, what stuck out for you that you're like, that's something I could use in a more positive way. Was there anything like that that you saw as you were reading through? Cause I know, you know, you're always improving your, your yeah. systems and things like something had to jump out at you. Like maybe I could use that or maybe uh, just not. I'm just curious. No, no, no. They, you're right. 100%. Even though, again, like I said, when I first read it, I was like, man, this is ominous. And that's <laughs> what I think of like, how dark is this? Um, how does it relate to me and my, <laughs> but, but you're right. I looked at some of the things because, uh, you're borrowing from everything that works, right? That's right. what we do is we borrow some people, you know, want to use the term you steal, but I like the term borrow. Uh, and, and what I found in this that I thought was very, I don't want to say curious, but interesting was the community, right? And how the community drive the, just kind of the excitement level of it. And, and also the, um, credibility of it because they're getting recognition by their peers and, and it starts to evolve. The bigger the, the community, the larger the community, the bigger the idea and the more it sticks. And, you know, if, like, I think it even mentioned it in there somewhere where it said, if it's just one person saying it, nobody's listening, then, you know, it doesn't have any right. it doesn't have traction, but the more people say it, the more it grows, the more the idea grows. It actually reminded me of uh, the movie Inception a little bit, you know, how you have to plant the seed to make it their idea and make yes. it seem like they're the one that thought about it. That was another piece there is, is how do we make it uh, that their career is uh, is based on their, uh, not, not necessarily idea, but their commitment to achieving their career goals. You just got to give them that path and let them define the path. And the more that they're committed to that definition and committed to the journey, and committed to the ultimate goal, the more they're going to stay committed to the organization. And so that was another component that I felt that, you know, it's definitely something that we can leverage in, in the development of our, of our application. Yeah. I know. You just um, mentioned Sean's favorite movie, by the way. Yeah. My favorite marketing movie is definitely inception. Like to me, that is the ultimate idea of, of marketing is to make 
whatever you're selling feel like their idea of wanting their to buy. idea absolutely right? and i was actually talking to a to a one of my guys today and we were talking about this and like extrinsic versus intrinsic motivation and if and i was like i was trying to tell him like if you can figure out what their intrinsic motivation is and then tie it to the what you need done you'll get a lot further than trying to constantly you know help you know hold them accountable or externally motivate them with you know prizes or you know mm -hmm. time off or whatever right if you can find out what their intrinsic motivation is then it just you know it feeds itself the other right. thing i was thinking is as you were talking there was like um as far as community one of the th cool things on on peloton is how you can give each other high fives yeah. during a ride and that makes a huge difference i mean you know you'll you, you tend to find yourself kind of in the same pack during the ride because you're yeah. all about you know there's so many people on the ride there's a there's a good 20 30 riders that you're kind of around for 20 30 minutes an hour whatever your ride is so you kind of keep high-fiving those people they high-five you and it's just it kind of and you don't once you high five, it, it's like it's like this weird thing, like you think you know them. Yeah. No. You like you, like you need to perform. You can't fall way back and you you know you gotta stay in the pack, right? Yeah, you gotta stay in there. Like and uh, yeah. we actually have that same feature as it's part of so we have a leaderboard, we have a public display board that 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 uh, broadcasts events. So every time somebody closes a deal, reaches a milestone, meets a challenge. There's an opportunity for all of their peers to interact, you know, through and we, we keep the, the comments fixed so that way, you know, there's no liability, uh, but they can like each other. They can comment. They can say way to go. You know, some of the fix or they can use emojis. Uh, but same thing, like whether it's a pound, a high five. Uh, but that peer recognition and, 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 and I'm sure that you felt the same way. If somebody high fives you, there's that feeling of I need to reciprocate that. Right. So I'm looking out for his back now. And I'm going to support that person because they supported me. And that creates and builds community and camaraderie, in, which is really hard to develop in a culture, especially in a call center space, especially in a space where there's high attrition, where there's new people sitting next to you all the time. So when you build that, and even in the new workforce, which is more remote, how do you keep that engagement? You know, it's yeah. through those interactions. And so it's an important part of gamification are those interactions and that support tool. Well, you know, it goes back to the idea too of, you know, just the fact that there's an observer changes the dynamic, right? Mm -hmm. So if you know somebody's watching you on the leaderboard because they <laughs> give you a high five, now you know they're watching. Yeah, you perform yeah. differently. Yeah. Like it changed the the observer changes the the action. I mean, that's an old I think journal that's from journalism. I think like okay. there's no yeah. such thing as a you know an observer that doesn't influence. I mean, you can go all the way to quantum physics and the double slit experiment and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> like just observation changes the dynamics of the of the sure whatever you're observing well take uh working out for example right what's the difference between working out by yourself or with a workout partner yeah or a trainer right you've got an observer you know yeah. you you know you're you, it's easy to give up like you know what i'll, I'll just get it on the next set yeah. you got somebody watching you know whether they're pushing you or not they're watching you know it helps you motivate you to get to that to complete the level Yes, yeah, like, are they counting reps, or can I cheat this rep? Or are they counting? I, I better, I better do one more just in case they're counting too. Right? Partner is counting. Yeah, yeah. Accountable. I mean, that's that's one reason CrossFit, I think, is has been so oh, powerful yeah. over the last 10, 20 years because you would never push that hard by yourself. And the fact right. that other people are doing it, there's a clock. There's, you know, they've done a great job of, I think, gamification as well with all their the games, know, their the CrossFit games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and they, the competitions. Because yeah. they refer to themselves as athletes now. I mean, so they're actually competing. You know, they're part yeah. of it. They're competing in a game. Yeah. So, it's. Have you ever done CrossFit? Oh yeah, I did. I did it for four or five years. Yeah. And, uh, it's it's, it's, a, it's a whole new level of yeah. It's a, it's a different kind of suck. Yeah. I don't agree with everything. I think sometimes it's it's too much too often. Mm -hmm. I don't think you should have to go that hard every day. It's just yeah, not yeah. I'm sure it works. it's jink to your body, I think. But I, I mean, if you want to get into shape quick, it's yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's great. It's great for that. And if you can learn how to take a day off, because because yeah. it's it is a community, so you kind of get addicted yeah. to, especially now, like with more remote work, more remote work in the areas that you can get out. Mm -hmm. Like you want to go see people and you want to work out with people because, like, you know, you need it. 
Um, yeah. So I, I, yeah, I was down that road for a while. I do some other crazy stuff now, but, uh, do the Peloton obviously. And then I, I do this weird electro stem treatment where they, you wear a full body electrode suit and it shocks you for 15 <laughs> minutes, basically. Off yeah. Other people holding the shocker doing it for you. <laughs> they have a little thing that they, it's a, it's a whole system that, um, uh, it's like, you know, seven to 10 seconds on and then four to six seconds off. And it's, you're doing movements while you're doing, it. it's pretty wild. So, uh, it's, it's a whole, it's crazy. Whole, whole, whole nother show. But yeah. so is there anything else that stood out for you, Jimmy, in that, in that article that you're like, I, I could pull, I could use that for good and not evil. I'm curious about Easter. Eggs. So we hear a lot, a lot about Easter eggs, yeah. you know, people talk about them in movies and pop culture. Um, my kids use that phrase a lot, you know, so, you know, I've gotten used to it, but sure. Yeah. What are you referring to? Uh, you know, Easter eggs. These are things that really kind of, they're like puzzles, right? I mean, that people are trying to constantly kind of read into and figure out. Yeah. I, I think that's part of the mystery, right? Um, and the puzzle solving and the hunt, right? So the Easter egg it refers back to the Easter egg hunt, right? So, I mean, mm -hmm. we've all had to miss kids. If you have kids, you've done them for your kids where you go out there and you hide Easter Easter eggs all around the backyard or wherever. Yeah. And there's one golden one usually that has the biggest, you know, $20 bill or whatever have you. Right. Uh, and people want to find that one. And that one you hide in the most difficult place to find. Right. So, and that's, that's the whole idea of the Easter egg is the hunt is, is never over. Like you're always searching and you're searching for that big one. And so Easter egg hunts are, is another, is another way to keep users engaged. Uh, you know, Sean, I think you said it earlier, how do you not let it wear out? How do you keep it, you know, fresh and engaging so that way they don't get bored with it over time. And that's one way. And it also is part of the community. People are talking about this Easter egg. Hey, did you look over here? No, I didn't. Now I'm going to go check that out. And Hey, there's a way to break through that wall. Um, you know, for us, it's, it's about the way we use the Easter eggs is, you know, we use what we call treasure chests. So, you know, we allow them to get treasure chests in a mysterious different ways in mysterious places so that they have to go to different areas of the application to get those chests. Mm -hmm. uh, and that helps, you know, with them learning more about the application, because this is, you got to remember, we have, we're trying to find that, strike that balance between uh, fun and engaging and then distracting because it, we're, we're selling this tool to a business, you know, so that they can keep their people engaged. You don't want to go too far where, look, these people aren't working. They're just on your app all day, you know. Uh, so you have to tie it with their work, but at the same time, try to strike that balance. And but carrying that beyond just work where they can go home and go on the phone app and then go searching for that Easter egg hunt. Again, builds that brand recognition, builds that kind of uh, addictiveness addictive quality or habit forming qualities, I like to say, where they want to stay engaged with the application, which should translate to they want to stay engaged at work. And, you know, that, yeah. Uh, the benefit. yeah, that keeps them, uh, that keeps their attention, uh, yeah. you know, drawn to it. Here's, I'm going to read this excerpt because this is fascinating, sure. just to follow up with what you said. So from this article, he says, uh, uh, there's no reality here, no actual solution in the real world. Instead, this is a breadcrumb away uh, trail away from reality, away from actual solutions towards a dangerous psychological rush. And we'll talk about that here in a second. But it says it works very well because when you figure it out yourself, you own it. You experience the thrill of discovery, the excitement of a rabbit hole. Or, or the rabbit hole, the acceptance of community that loves and respects you. That's another element uh, because you were convinced to connect the dots yourself. You can see the absolute logic of it, of it. This is the conclusion you arrive at. So, you know, there's a lot to that, but it talks about the psychological rush of, you know, actually figuring something out mm -hmm. of discovering something. I think that that's kind of part of what addicts people, not only in, in video games, in any kind of game, but also in conspiracy theories is that like, oh, wait, I figured something out. I figured out a clue mm -hmm. because I'm involved, you know, instead of just being fed something. I think what's different about this, Sean, you mentioned other conspiracies in the past. And I think what's different a little about, you know, maybe this as opposed to other things in the past is that this is 
told people like to use your own or kind of research yourself and try to start figuring out, which is kind of addictive in itself. You start figuring things out. It leads you from down one rabbit hole to the next. And you think, you know, when you feel like you figured something out, people congratulate. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they congratulate you and say, yeah, you've done a great job. Uh, now you got to move on to the next one. You know? Which so, goes back to kind of what we talked about, you know, hundreds of times on this show is like, and it makes you feel safe, makes you feel part of the tribe. Absolutely. You're not going to kick out of the tribe because you're a That's valuable right. member, right. like all that stuff that it goes back to. Yep. Your thoughts, Jimmy? Uh, I mean, it's again, the difference between when, when you're, when you're building games, right? There are boundaries. You're set to boundaries. I mean, you can stretch those boundaries, but you're still inside of boundaries. Sure. And, and the users know that there are boundaries, you know, it's mm -hmm. hard create a dynamic game that has limitless possibilities with no end in sight. Uh, with life such as this, you know, the, the designers, I'll put that in quotes or whoever's doing the manipulation, you know, it's, it's a very dynamic world that changes all the time. So there's new clues that and clues yeah. that they find and then they lead you to, right? So, and it, that's the difference between persuasion and manipulation right so i want to persuade you to do better in work at work so i want to provide you engaging tools to help you get there because it's going to benefit you your family and the business right. where manipulation is more of hey i want you to come this way and again the the maliciousness of it again, i don't know the purpose and so yeah. i can't speak specifically about what their purpose is but sure. it seems like it's a it's an endless game. There is no getting out of that rabbit hole. Right. And I know a lot of people who, you know, they'll send me links. I mean, who are QAnon followers and like, check this out, check this out. It's like, All right. You know. yeah, I, I, I have to say I tapped out um, when, when it started being everything yeah. was related. I was like, look, it, this group can't control everything. Like sure. it's just not practical or possible. Like you, you can't control Kim trails and this and that, and that, and that right. like, it, it's not all connected. Nobody's right. I mean, you know how hard it is to manage a committee. Like I can't imagine, like it, there's no way a, a group of human beings <laughs> That's right. could keep all that straight. Like it's yeah. just impossible. It's, it's difficult. And I don't know about you, Jimmy, but Sean and I were in the, we, we worked for the guy. We were in the military for quite a few years and we know the, <laughs> the military is not that organized sometimes, <laughs> a lot of times, you know, so, uh, we laugh at that sometimes realizing that uh, uh, there's a lot of snafus that happen in planning a lot you yeah. know, that happen in the military and in government. So it's just crazy. Yeah. They can assign so much uh, sovereignty over something that's so, you know, fallible and, you know, it's, it's a bunch of humans running it. So yeah. it's yeah, and we, mistakes. We could, we could get it like, you know, there's, there's all kinds of reasons I think why this is, so prevalent now and i think it's i listened to a podcast one time that talked about like you know politics became the new religion because people were leaving the churches and they didn't have that to stand on so then they went to politics and now politics is kind of crumbling and like so th so the reason conspiracy theories and these things take hold is because people need something to believe in yeah you know? and the bigger sure. it is the more it explains yeah and i think that's why this particular one has just grown like crazy is because if it covers everything then everything's covered mm -hmm. and there's some safety there's some peace as crazy as that is in that so i mean yeah but there's a i mean there's safety in i don't know if i would call it peace because i mean it, there, there's it's a, a, it's, it's a right? form of peace for sure, but it's <laughs> an expectation that this is going to come to an end. And I think that's one sure. of the big drivers in, in the most recent days that something is going to happen. Something right. can happen. Then Absolutely. it doesn't. Well, that's, they're waiting for this to happen and then it yeah. doesn't. And then right. this is going to happen and then it doesn't. So I think you're going to get, see a lot of people start to fall off that wagon. Oh, I agree. You know? Yeah. Cause yeah. they're saying, you know, you can only move the goalposts so far until the okay. goalposts get moved off the, uh, right. And then you yeah, know, off the field. Yeah, Same. what's the uh, what's the proverb say? A hope deferred makes the heart sick. Like <laughs> you, you push that hope out far enough, and people just right. they can't take it anymore. Exactly. Like that, and then then they go look for the next the next thing. Yeah, what's right. the next thing to hang their hat on? So, uh, so from a positive, real quick, from a positive standpoint, on you know gaming, what is the most 
if you can pull, let's talk about what like the most addictive qualities to any game that people kind of like keeps people. Cause you, you talked about the, you kind of hinted on this, like, you know, the challenge in any gamification, even from a positive standpoint in business mm -hmm. is keeping people in the game. Right. So, you know, and you probably hinted on this. What what do you think is the most, in your opinion, is the most addictive quality to a game that can be used in a positive way for business, applied to business, and to keep people engaged? Because you yeah. you know, as you mentioned, younger generations today, um, they kind of need that. So uh, yeah. to keep them on board. I I have a, a fourteen year old son, and you know, I've I watch and play video games. You know, we. Yeah used to play i remember i mean I, I grew up a gamer you know i was on the you know atari nintendo genesis sure. and you know all the way through and then i got you know old enough where i had to kind of focus on on work so i didn't i wasn't addicted to it but i, I grew up on it and so even when my my son was young you know i'd give him a controller and he'd think he'd play and one day i turned the controller on and he actually was playing um, but i followed his uh kind of trajectory on and on, on games and one of the, the coolest new things about video games, which it's cool, but it's also dangerous is, you know, when we had to go, when we wanted to play with our friends, we'd have to pick a house and go to that house and play together. Right. You know, right? You'd have to have, you know, two controllers or you get the multi-tap and you get four controllers and now they can play online. Right. And, you yeah. know, multi-user across the world. So they're at home, they got their headphones. Um, <clears throat> it, what that does is it builds a different sort of community, right? And and I think when you ask the question, what is the biggest uh, advantage or part of it is is community. I think we're so disengaged and distracted and in our own little world with technology is this is a good way to at least have some human interaction. Even if you are using technology, I don't think technology is ever going to be avoidable. Like, yeah, go to the woods, go camping, disconnect, put leave your phones in the cars. But when you're at work, you know, you're using technology to work, you know, unless you're in a trade. And so building that community, having that engagement, those interactions, even if it is with technology, now with remote work where people are now, you know, <clears throat> you know, pulled apart and put into their own little environments, you need that community. And I think that yeah. part of gamification is Huge. probably positive. Yeah. I, I've got I've got two teenagers like you. I've got a 15 to 17. My 17 doesn't play game. He used to play games. He doesn't play. My 15 year old still plays, but the only games that he plays are ones not he doesn't care about things that he plays on his own. He likes to compete with other people and he likes to talk to them while he's playing. So yeah. you know you can hear him at night. And I actually think that you know, I think that's pretty good because a lot of the games that he plays are strategy games and, and they're teamwork type games. Yeah. Whereas, you know, those are kind of helping. They're they're sometimes they're talking smack and sometimes they're, you know, just rambling and you know, do what teenagers do. But a lot of times they're working. I, I hear him sometimes in his room mm -hmm. and a lot of it's like teamwork orientation type things. And I'm thinking, eh, that's pretty good. You know, they're actually helping one another kind of beat the other team so and yeah, as well i mean somebody's got to take the leadership role and help lead right. the team. so somebody's going to step up and, and, and you know you'll develop mm -hmm. leadership skills along the way as well as teamwork skills so there are a bunch of cool new skills that people are learning online you just got to recognize them sure. and make sure you steer your ch your children towards those the positives you know yeah. because you just don't want them in their room alone all day for four hours playing video games right you know, it is nice knowing that they're on with their friends, you know, Absolutely. especially COVID when they can't go out and play. Right. Yeah, I agree. My son's 25 and I, you know, same thing when he was a little bit young, he still plays and he's got the headset and, you know, you can hear him talking and, and it's not yeah. just the game. It's like, they're just talking too while yeah. they're, while they're playing the game, mm -hmm. which, you know, Jonathan, us being in the military, like that's how it was when you're out and, you know, that's doing right. field exercises, like, that's right. you know, you just, you know, talk about just whatever. Not sleeping under a tree or in a in a in a tank yeah. or a, you know. But yeah, you're talking about whatever, and then yeah. and action happens, and you get engaged, and then you you know right. that's over, and then you go back to talking a little bit. But it, it yeah. does build a cool community. Well, we've got another. Uh, uh, I'll let our next guest know we're about five minutes late, but we need to go ahead and wrap up. Yeah. Jonathan, yeah. So. Well, Jimmy, it's been a pleasure. I, we appreciate you coming on today. And uh, how can people find out more about your company, some of the work you guys do? Uh, if you would share that. 
Yeah, go to www.playzizzo.com, and uh, that's play and then Z-I-Z-O, which mm-hmm. just so you guys know, Zizzo stands for zoom in, zoom out. It's the ability okay. to manage from the clouds up above the forest and then drill down into the granularness of data and get the details to help your, your people out. So playzizzo.com, more information there. They got links to all of our social media sites on the uh, on the website itself. So Sean awesome. and John, I appreciate you guys having me on the uh, on the podcast here. It's been a pleasure, and uh, I look forward to uh, to seeing you guys in other podcasts. It's been a blast. Thank you. Fun. We'll thank you, uh, we'll post a link on our show page. Jimmy, as always, thank thank you again for uh, for coming on, and uh, we'll uh, we'll talk to you. Like Sean said, we got another guest coming up, but I'll be reaching out to you by email once we get this link posted. I'll be sending it over your way. You got it. Thank you, John. All right. All right, take yeah, thanks. thanks again. Good stuff, man. Good yeah, stuff. Man, we could talk all day about that, I think. Yep. As usual. <laughs> as usual. Um, but yeah, we've got another show to do. So as always, you can find us over at uh, persuasionbythepint.com. You can find us on all of your social media platforms. And thanks again to uh, all of our listeners. Uh, Sean, it's been fun. And we'll see you on the next episode. See ya. All right.